All right, well, good morning. Good morning. Everybody's here today. You know, we, we got to like the ambit count of the joy today. Hopefully, as you guys are going on in the Christmas season, that, that you take this and you think about the joy that Christ gives us in our life and, and what it really means in our life because without Christ, I, I believe we cannot have the joy that we need to have for this Christmas season. Uh, we are in Romans chapter 13. We're going to be in verses 1 through 7. And, you know, we just got off the heels of, of Paul giving us a Christian to-do list. He, he just, he, 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 he set out and, and he talked about our characteristics of a Christian. Um, midway through that chapter and, and characteristics we need to have as a Christian for the world to, to see as we walk. And then he turned around and, and, and he talked about how we need to, as Christians, relate to unbelievers. And, and he laid out a few things that we need to do with, with that. Mm -hmm. And now he's talking about, in these first seven verses, really how we need to relate to the government. On uh, top of this, you know, where does God and country meet? Uh, and, it, and he's talking about how, mm -hmm. how we need to relate to the government. And so that's where we are. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So if you will, please stand. I read Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Every person is to be subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for concise, for concise sake. For because of this you also pay taxes, for rulers are servants of God, devoted themselves to the very thing, render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to what, to whom custom is due, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Let's pray with you. Lord, Father, just thank you to be able to come in here and, and worship you today. God, just be able to worship you in song and in praise and lift you up in, in those songs and God. Just thankful that I'm able to do that. Lord, I pray um, that the message that is going to be here today is your, your words and not mine. God, I know it's only through your strength that I'm able to do anything. But God, it's all about you. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Man, it's been a few years back, but you remember the federal court in California, the judges was trying to say it's un unconstitutional for the phrase in the Pledge of Allegiance of one nation under God. You know, I, I thought about that and thought, man, these guys, they just don't get it, do they? They just don't understand what that means. Because some 239 years ago, we declared our independence from England and struck out as an independent nation, governing ourselves and seeking our own way. You know, if you want to just go back so about 300 years ago, you know, people came to the shores of America wanting uh, religious freedom. And in England, in the late 1600s, there was an oppression of sorts being waged against the people who believed that the Roman Catholic Church was not right. And they tried to break free of that. They tried to start worshiping God the way they were supposed to solely based on Scripture. And the Catholic Church and the Church of England began to persecute these new believers in many ways. And one of the ways that this persecution was, was they were allowed to uproot their family, get on a ship, go to a distant land which they would know nothing about, and then they could worship God the way they wanted to worship God. These people established colonies with laws based on the foundation of biblical principles and Judeo-Christian ethics. You know, and as they started submitting to God, they prospered. 
In the late 1700s, a group of men gathered together what is known as the Continental Congress. These men sought to separate themselves and that states they represented for the tyranny and the tax oppression from the English Empire. A group of 56 men gathered to commission the writing of a document that fundamentally changed the way government was done, and they came up with the Declaration of Independence, and a new nation was born. These men knew full well the consequences of signing that document, as most of them, if not all of them, when they, when they died, not either very poor or, or, or poverty stricken. And some of these men spent time in jail and even died for signing that independence, that Declaration of Independence. But out of that bravery, our great nation was born. It was a nation founded on godly Christian principles. Everything used to form our nation was derived from principles out of Scripture. They called for prayer in God's direction and providence to help them establish this nation. That's why we are called a Christian nation. With all that being said, with all that history and facts that we know were the founding elements of our nation, the question is, is our nation living up to the claim of being a Christian nation? I believe that we have fallen way short from where we have started. We look at this passage today and it gives us really a perfect opportunity to look at just how this nation depends on and recognize not a God, but the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and the God of the Bible. And where does God and country meet? How can we be good patriots and yet good Christians? Can we be both in the way this nation is right now? Do we have to sacrifice the love of God or the love of the country for one or the other? And Paul, like I said, in his, in his chapter 12, by extorting his readers about the Christian lifestyle. Now he discusses how they should relate to the government. Man, you, you think about this, this the, the Christians in Rome was just a small group of people, and there was no way that they could, they could try to have a, 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 a political agenda. Paul is saying, saying listen, you can't have a political agenda if you want to try to spread the gospel. You have nothing to stand on, no, nothing to back you up. It is, it is you against that government, but you cannot, cannot be and have a political agenda. I mean, I can you imagine the, 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 that group trying to, to <coughs> further the kingdom of God, but if they was going to try to rise up, Against the Roman Empire just wouldn't work. I'm convinced, though, that here and now in our nation and in our government, we can be both a good patriot and a good Christian. Mm -hmm. I want to show today how really that can happen. I'm convinced it's not only possible, but that Christians, that we have a holy obligation to be the best citizens we can possibly be. So, so we're going to look at that today. We're going to look at just how we can be a people who love God and people who love their country. So let's dig into the scripture. Verses 1 and 2 here in chapter 13 says, Every person is to be subjection to the governing authority, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they, have, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. So Paul, Paul is basically telling this group of, uh, of, uh, of Christians there in Rome that they are to submit to the governing authorities. Submission means cooperation, loyalty, a willingness to obey. They're, these were really wise words to this small group of, of, uh, of believers living in this massive structure of the Roman Empire. I mean, even though their submission wasn't going to guarantee peace, it was going to give them the ability to continue to spread the gospel freely. Paul explained how Christians should live within the structure because only then they would, they would be able to share the gospel that transforms society. I believe that as a Christian, submitting to God is our most basic responsibility. <coughs> I think that we need to submit to God and everything.
everything that we do. And, and, and I also believe that we can't submit to God if we're not willing to submit to the authorities above us. As children, as kids, if you can't submit to your parents, then how can you submit to God? As adults, if we can't submit to our bosses, then how can we submit to God? If we can't submit to our government, then how can we not submit to God? I, I believe that, that there's a rebellion in our heart, and we're going to also rebel against God. Uh, it's just the way I believe, you know. Uh, if we don't learn proper submission in, in the areas that God has given us, our submission to God really could be imaginary. Yep. When we learn how to submit to God by submitting to those who God has placed in authority over us, then we will be able to submit to God or be more likely to submit to God. You know, we should respect our government and obey its laws. And, and guys, I really believe there's three interpretations on how we can submit to our government. First, I, I believe that, that, that some Christians believe that the state is so corrupt that we should have as little as possible to do with it. I, I can see that. I mean, you know, why, why do you want to have to do with something that, that is evil and corrupt as our, as our state is? The second thing is, other believers, others believe that God has given us the state authority in certain areas and the church authority in others. And I, I can see that opinion too. And some believe that Christians have the responsibility to make the state better. That last one I can really get behind it because I think it's our right, our duty to try to make our government better. We can do that by electing other Christians as leaders and by morally serving as an influence for good. And whichever <coughs> view you think is correct, we need to understand that none of these views advocates rebellion against or refusing to obey the laws or regulations unless they clearly require a person to violate the moral standards revealed by God. And I can, I can only go to Daniel and think of Daniel. You know, as, as, as Babylon came and, and, and defeated the Israelites and then took, took them back and how, how King Nebuchadnezzar took the best of the young men to... to Teach them their laws and their rules and their, 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 their way of living. That's how, that's how they would, would, would try to make them conform to what they were going to do. And how Daniel, when he was, he was given things to eat, and he, he's like, no, I can't eat that stuff. It, 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 it violates my, my religious rights. I mean, we, we know that story well, right? You know, and how he did it the right way. And God prospered him. You see that Daniel would not bow to hell of King Nebuchadnezzar. And God prospered. When we submit the right way and do the right things, God will prosper us. In verses 3 through 5, it says, For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? You what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger, who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. So verses 3 and 4 really focuses on officials who are doing their duty. Society needs leadership and positive constraining in order to ensure the safety and well-being of its citizens. You know, they didn't have a government here in Rome the way we have a government here. And we can look at our government and we can say things about our government that we don't like and point out things about our government, but I'll take our government over any other government around the world. It might not be the best that we think it is, but I guarantee it's better than, than a lot not most of the other governments in this world. If we look at our officials, mm. we just pray that they do the right thing. Mm. But as a people, we have to do, as a Christian, we have to do the right thing. I, and I don't think that, that we have a fear if we do the right thing. If we if we live rightly and, and correctly and we follow God's rules and we live as, as the rules that are underneath God, we don't have anything to fear from our government because if we want to come and worship God and, and live a Christian life,
life, we, we really don't have that. But it, where people have to fear is when they start rebelling against God. We are not called to do that. You know, I think we just need to continue to seek what is right, to live correctly by Scripture, and, and to live that way. And you know what? Then if we have a disagreement with the government, then there are places where we can voice our opinion, where we can try to change the government, we can try to do what's right. But we can't do it if we don't live correctly by which God has given us the ability to live. You know, rulers are in position only because God has placed them there. And they are ultimately responsible to God. Proverbs 21.1 says the king's heart is at the hand of the Lord. He directs it like a water course wherever he pleases. So willingly or, or unwittingly, people in authority are God's servant. Paul's not teaching that all in authority are God's servant as a saying that we are God's servant. Amen. But they are God's servants ultimately because God has put them there. We go and we look at Pharaoh, and God put Pharaoh there for his heart to be hardened so he could bring his people out of Egypt. We Amen. see that God does that. We might not like the person that's in office now. I mean, that, and, I, and I can say that, you know, but, but we are called. God, but we know that God has allowed them in their position to do what he wants them to do. And that should provide a motivation to pray for our leaders. We have two good reasons to submit, to avoid punishment and to heed our own conscience. As Christians, we should follow our conscience because it will prod us to do what's right. And that is, causes us to obey the authorities that pleases God. We might not ever gain any recognition for doing what is right, but, but we are called. And Paul reminds the Romans that God notices every action. And submitting to those who have authority over us pleases God. So we look at verses 6 and 7. It says, For because of this you also pay taxes. For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to the very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom taxes due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. So, so we are not only called to submit to authority, but Paul says that we are to render to them for taxes. We are to pay taxes. We are to do that. Paul knew that the Roman Christians would try to get away with, with not paying that inflated taxes. Um, it would inevitably certainly draw attention of the authorities, and that would be stopped. And they would be put at risk. And what really Paul is following what Jesus said um, in, in Matthew 12, 7, when, when, when Jesus told Peter to pay taxes. He said, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. That means to that means to to render to all that's due tax. That means the customs of how to live. It means to fear whom to fear, to honor who to honor. And God is the one to fear. God is the one to honor. That is who we submit to, but because of God being here and He putting people in place of a government, we are to submit to our government as long as it does not keep us from violating our moral standards. So I got four points I want to talk about about how to be the best Christian citizen we can be. And the first is uh, to be the best Christian citizen, we must remember His sovereignty. Remember His there was a Sunday school teacher that was, was telling the story of Abraham and, 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 and his obedience and preparing to sacrifice Isaac, and she was very dramatic and, and talking about it, and the story was near its climax, and a, and a little girl pleaded and said, oh, oh, please don't go on, the story's too terrible. And the little girl interrupted and said, don't, don't be silly, Mary. This is one of God's stories, and God's stories always come out right. And God rules and overrules and causes everything to come out right for his children who love him. You know, those who are, who are loving God and following his perfect truth call know that all things work together for God's good. 
think we can look back in our own lives and think about things that we thought was a disaster in our life. Look, look at things that, that, that we thought was for the bad in our life. Look, look back at things and say, why am I going through this? And we can look back at that now and say, oh God, I can see why you did that. How many times does that happen in our life? I think it happens a lot more than what we think about. Amen. Romans 8.28, and what a staple we have in Romans 8.28 when we're going through difficult times. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. That doesn't mean that everything works out perfectly for us. You know what? God, God works out things for His glory and for our better. Sometimes, though, it, it's more for his glory than our betterment. Because when we look at his glory, and that's the way it's going to end out, end up. God doesn't try to please us on everything that we do. Because God, not that God's going to please us. He, he's going to work out things that's going to show his glory in our life. You know, the Bible freely, fully accepts the free agency of man. But interacting with the free will of man is the overruling hand of a sovereign God that takes that, that that works behind the scenes, that takes care of things that we don't know of a God that 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 is everywhere and knows everything. Yep. Those who love God and follow His purpose are assured that all things are working for our eternal good and for His glory. What we got to do is just totally trust God in, in, our, in our life, that He has control. We need to live our lives as He has a plan, and it's going to execute that plan perfectly. And as Christians, we ought to be in submission to the government authorities, even though we may not always agree with them. But we have to understand that God is the one that's in control. John MacArthur wrote, Believers are to be model citizens, known as law body excuse me, Believers are to be model citizens, known as law-abiding, not rabble-rousing, obedient rather than rebellious, respectful of government rather than demeaning of it, a godly society doing good and living peacefully with an ungodly society so that the saving power of God is clearly seen. I thought that was a good quote by Tom MacArthur. So that's, that's my first point. My second point is to be the best Christian citizens we must seek His grace. Amen. Seek His grace. When I look at history, when I look at the way our country was founded, I'm convinced that it was only by God's grace and mercy that our nation ever came into existence. Amen to that. And that we lasted long enough to enjoy the freedom and blessings that's ours today. I mean, yeah, you just think about where our nation came from. And I think God's grace was poured out upon us when our founding fathers sought his guidance and protection in forming a republic on this continent, unlike any other world government the world has ever seen. I mean, you think about how great that our nation truly is compared to the rest of the world. A nation dedicated to the idea of being one nation under God. I think God has truly blessed America. But Isaiah 40, 15 says... Surely the nations are like a drop in a the bucket. They are regardless of dust on the scales. And I read that simply to be reminded just how fragile and temporal we really are. Amen. No matter how powerful or rich we may seem to be in God's hands, we're just a disaster or two away from destruction. And if God chooses so, he can blow us away just like dirt being blown across the, the sidewalk. We need a nation that seeks God's grace. 2 Chronicles 7, 14 says, And my people who call by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, and I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and leave, and I will heal their land. When I read that, he is not talking about unbelievers. He is talking to believers about turning and going back to Christ. About God. He is talking about People who who don't who know Christ as a Lord and Savior. To me, I, I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, man, 
as believers, we have to repent and turn our faces to God. For healing, for His grace is to continue on this nation. Our nation was built upon Him, and I believe that as a nation, we need to get back to Him. And we need to seek His grace. And I think it's our duty as Christians, citizens, to make sure that we seek His grace. The next thing I want us to see, to be the best Christian citizens, we must make our faith apparent. Make our faith apparent. Amen. You know, back in the late 80s, California's school system was really spiraling out of control. A group of Christians started getting together, started talking about voting Christians onto the school board, voting Christians to where, where they, could, they could make a difference. And so, this group of Christians got together and they started putting Christians on the school board. And in, in about 92 to 94, these Christian parents started making an impact in their school system there in California. And their school system, the scores of the students started rising dramatically because the Christian parents were being involved in their schools and getting things taken care of. You know, and, and I think about that, you know, just what it would mean for us as Christians to make our faith known in the government. Mm -hmm. I mean, man, if we could just get together and start putting Christians in places of authority and showing our faith instead of letting things go a lot of times, I, I believe our government would be a whole lot better. I believe a lot of times, though, as Christians, we... And, and, and I, I think about me, and, and, and I know that I'm one of them, that sometimes just passively sit by as government starts doing things that I know that is wrong. But man, we, we as Christians really need to show our faith. We need to make it apparent when we go to the polls. We need to, we need to start looking at people who are, who are Christian-based, truly Christian-based, and not just saying that they're a Christian. And we need to really make our faith apparent to people. We need to look for people who burn with a passion to serve God and others. Because serving God is much more than an emotional experience. Serving God is more than, 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 than great worship or good music. Serving God is more than reading our Bibles and praying every day. Serving God is more than keeping ourselves unspotted from the culture around us. Serving God is being faithful to what He calls us. In 2 Kings chapter 2, 1 and 2, there's a story of, uh, of Elijah and Elisha. It says that when it came about when the war was about to take up Elijah and the war went to heaven, and Elijah went from went with Elisha from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. And we see that Elisha was very faithful to Elijah. It's like, I am not going to leave you. I am going to be with you. I think that we need to have a type of faith that causes us to want to be the very best Christian citizens that we can be. Amen. That we need to make our faith apparent and our witness relevant to those around us. I think that, that that's very important. And the last thing we need to do is to be uh, the best Christian citizens that we must pray for our leaders. We must pray for our leaders. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it says, First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions, and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men, from kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Amen. And Paul's command to pray for king was responsible, considering you know who, the king, who was king at that time? It was Nero. Okay, this was the most wretched uh, man ever. If you had something against the government at that point in time and you went in front of King Nero getting on him for his policies, you were probably put on a stake and burned. I mean, and Paul is saying, we need to pray for your king and you need to pray for your country. I mean, you think about what, what he is stating. It's not about 
us praying for our president, even though we don't like our president, this is praying for a king that, that wore the persecute and killed Christians. Man. Hey, they didn't have a voice. And Paul says you need to pray for people in authority. I think we take good government for granted. But mm -hmm. I think we should be praying for those who govern us. Whether we agree with them or not, whether we voted for them or not, we need to be praying for our for our nation and our leaders. We need to pray for 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 those who are in authority so we can leave them in peace. We we need to pray for the plans and the prop, and the purposes of God to be fulfilled in our nation. We need to pray for leaders with wisdom and integrity to lead our nation. We need to pray until the blessings of God are poured out on our nation. We need to pray as as an intercessor standing in the gap to prevent the judgment of God on our nation. We need to pray for divine strength and discernment to live in these evil days. And we need to pray with divine authority to bind the plans of the enemy and release the purposes of God. Amen. And our president needs our prayer. Our governor needs our prayer. Our, 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 our county government needs our prayer. Our mayor needs our prayers. Our leaders and all the support staff, the legislators, and all the authority over us need our prayers. I think that's the only thing that we can do. That's the most powerful weapon that we have is to stand in that gap and pray for our government and, and the officials. Because as we pray for them, God will touch their hearts and strengthen those in authority. I think we need to pray for their souls and for their families. Because I think that if we, if we did that, we, if, if God changes people's hearts, how much better would our government be? Amen. So to wrap up, you know, I, I think in becoming the best Christian citizen that we can be, I think we have to really remember where our citizenship is. Philippians 3, 1, 17 through 21 says, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. So we have a dual citizenship. Even though we are here on this earth and we have to live here on this earth, that's not, that's not our home. Our home is in heaven. That's our, that's our citizenship. But while we are here, we need to live under the authority of our government best way that we can live and pray for our government so we can continue to live in the greatest country on this earth. It is not, it isn't perfect, but it is the greatest. And we need to make sure that as Christians that we have a voice.